Welcome back to The Explanation Pro. Today I'll recap a drama action film called, The Command. Spoilers incoming. The movie begins during the 2000s in Murmansk, wherein Russian naval captain Lieutenant Mikhail Averin spends his short time bonding with his family in the living area of their house. Afterward, he goes to the Oscar the second class submarine named Kursk to prepare for the Northern Fleet's exercise. While training, the employee suddenly announces that the budget is experiencing a shortage, making the sailors complain of not receiving their earned pay. Averin then asks what's going to happen to them, yet the employee gives him an answer about a deployment coming on their way, and that will give them a C bonus. After a while, Averin goes to the location of his friends, wherein he calls Anton and Oleg to borrow some money, but it seems like the man does not consider his offer. So, Averin trades their submariner's watches for supplies for the wedding of their crewmate, Oleg Pavel. Oleg tries to stop him, but Averin tells him it's okay. Afterward, the man gives the supplies they need for the wedding, including the vodkas. Later, the wedding begins, and Oleg successfully marries the love of his life, Daria, in the church, while Averin and Anton, on the other hand, happily celebrate Oleg's special occasion before leaving for work. Unfortunately, later on, Daria realizes that they traded their watches after asking her husband about it. However, Daria feels the admiration of Oleg for her. So, instead of feeling bad about it, she even thanks them for giving so much effort just so their wedding could happen. After the wedding, the sailors bid their goodbyes to their families by singing their anthem and handing the newly wed couple a toast. Then, Averin, on the other hand, spends his last night coupling with his sister in the living area. The following day, Averin meets his co-sailors and greets them as they enter the submarine, signaling them to begin their work once they get inside. Once inside, Averin interacts with his co-sailors by watching the band singing on television while drinking some coffee. Afterward, he visits his friend, Oleg, in the weapons. While talking, Oleg, the weapons officer, suddenly notes that the engine rises to 130 degrees within parameters, though it is not angry but irritated. So, Averin goes to the operating room to report that they need to watch the aft hydraulic system. Later, in the weapons room, Pavel hears the report from his colleague about the temperature of the HP practice torpedo. Pavel checks his colleague's watch to confirm the 135 degrees without hesitation. Afterward, he attends the meeting in the exercise area, where the officer announces their three phases of exercise in the submarine. These are the test missile fired, test torpedo filed, and return to base, undetected. Then, after the announcement, Oleg reports that the temperature of the experimental HTP torpedo is slightly elevated, indicating a possible hydrogen peroxide leak. Noting the submarine's proximity to the allowed zone and the still acceptable temperature of the torpedo, the officer then says that they will begin to fire it early once they reach their fire authorization window. Later, the fire officers go to the weapon room where Pavel is assigned. While checking, Pavel suddenly radios the command priority Karmadi to peek to the captain as he reports that the test torpedo is angry. Starting to get nervous, Oleg requests permission to fire before the authorized window. However, the captain says that they're not in a position to do it yet as they are still seven minutes from the authorization window. Unfortunately, the captain denies his permission and leaves Pavel on how to solve the problem, especially now that the temperature rises further. Suddenly, the torpedo explodes seconds after Pavel tells his crewmate to pray. Unluckily, the torpedo's impact kills the weapons room crew, including Pavel, resulting in the devastation of the boat due to the explosion. Meanwhile, Averin and his men, located aft, feel the explosion. So, they immediately secure the compartment and close all the valves. Afterward, they take precautions and determine the situation, while some begin panicking after realizing they get no response from the command where Pavel is assigned. Unfortunately, Averin, later on, receives the news that the explosions come from the torpedo room, killing all the crew inside it. Suddenly, the rapidly increasing temperature of the weapons room explodes the remaining artillery, in which Averin and Anton are staying. Unfortunately, the torpedo explosion kills another bridge crew and puts the ship to the bottom. Luckily, Averin protects himself from the fire, so he calls the other survivors to move aft to secure compartments as they go rapidly. The ship starts flooding because of the explosion, and Averin finds his friend, Anton, in the reactor room. Then, upon reaching the radio, he immediately contacts Anton, who says goodbye as his compartment floods and the reactor's melting down. And to save the rest of the crew, 
Anton chooses to secure the reactor to prevent a nuclear disaster, sacrificing himself to save lives. Afterward, Averin calls his crew to move in close compartment 9. While running, the remaining men, including Averin, rally in the aftmost compartment of the boat, which is rapidly taking on water. They all begin panicking and thinking about their following action to save themselves. So, Averin says they will stabilize the compartment first, then put their assets in the inventory, and evaluate their escape options. Meanwhile, Commander David Russell of the British Royal Navy has detected the seismic signature of the dual explosions, saying that the Russians have lost a submarine. Afterward, he orders his men to get him the Nortar seismic readouts for the Barents Sea as he quickly presumes that the Kursk has had an accident. Luckily, Commander David offers his assistance and calls Russian Northern Fleet Headquarters. Averin and the crew desperately await rescue at the compartment as the pump is not powerful enough to stop water from entering the chamber. Unfortunately, the water is above 1.5 meters already, and some of the crew begins panicking again as they rapidly fix the pump. Fortunately, Averin successfully finishes his job to close it, however, Leo struggles to control himself from overthinking. On the other hand, naval officers make a sole rescue to find any survivors inside the submarine. Meanwhile, the Sela's wives, including Averin's wife, Tanya, and Pavel's newly wed wife, Daria, suddenly hear the rumors about the fire that happened in the submarine. Because of that, Tanya and Daria make their way from the Northern Fleet's headquarters regarding the news about Kursk. Unfortunately, upon Tanya's arrival, the naval officer gives her no answers, saying that even if he knows about the happenings from the Kursk, he would not be authorized to tell her. Luckily, the other wives comfort the worried Tanya and Daria by telling them their experiences from their husbands. At the compartment, the crew is running out of oxygen. So, Averin orders Oleg to start the oxygen generator by giving him the cartridges to ignite it. Unfortunately, Oleg reports that there are no cartridges anymore, and only compartment 8 has it, in which they cannot get in since it's already sunk. Averin then feels sad after realizing that there is no other alternative to enable the oxygen generator. Meanwhile, Admiral Grudzinki orders the North Fleet to stop the engines from hearing the taps inside the submarine. As Grudzinki and his crew almost lose hope to believe in any survivors from the ship, Leo, on the other hand, talks to Averin that he needs to strike after realizing that they are on the hour. Luckily, Grudzinki's men hear the taps of the trapped men on the ship's hull. Afterward, Grudzinki contacts Rudnitsky to deploy the rescue ship immediately. Upon hearing the good news, Kulkin knocks on Tanya's house and informs her that they heard thumping from the Kursk. Happy, Tanya quickly runs towards her neighborhood to announce the wives about the news. Meanwhile, Commander David makes his own decision to call the LR-05 prepped and loaded as they get ready for air transport after getting no response from Grudzinki. Unfortunately, the trapped men begin panicking for the third time as they run out of oxygen upon waiting. Leaving them no choice. Averin calls Sasha to dive with him into the flooded compartments as they get the cartridges to enable the oxygen generator. Despite being clueless about where the cartridge is, Averin chooses never to lose hope and sacrifices himself to save his crew. Later on, Averin finally finds the cartridge and immediately gets back to the compartment after nearly dying in the process. Afterward, all of them agonizingly await another attempt to thump the hull. Luckily, they call themselves a little food and a few blankets despite the water level slowly continuing to rise. And while waiting, Averin and his men suddenly feel ecstatic upon hearing the submersible on their hull. However, while celebrating to be rescued, there is a sudden problem upon getting the men. The aged and ill-maintained submersible is unable to establish a seal, yet the naval officer orders to save them despite the need to return to the surface along with a 12-hour recharge of its batteries. Because of that, Averin and his men inside start rallying after they hear that the submersible hit the rudder, leaving them behind. But then, Averin stops them and says they will try again for sure. After the Russian submersible attempts to connect with the submarine that fails, they immediately go back surface and try fixing it. Then, Averin and the crew realize there are no batteries left as they already sold it with the mirror for the Titanic. Because of that, the morale of the crew members and their wives continues to plummet. At the compartment, the crew members start listening to the story of Oleg to prevent themselves from panicking. Despite the fear of dying, they still choose to laugh and live their moment inside the hull. Later at night, the Russian submersible is still trying to be fixed despite their common equipment types. 
Because of that, Russian Navy's Admiral Grudzinki finally calls Commander David to accept his offer of aid with up-to-date equipment and divers. Afterward, Commander David announces to the media about their collaboration with Russia to help rescue. Meanwhile, the crew members start panicking after seeing that the batteries of the oxygen generator are dead. Suddenly, Maxim opens the hatching chamber, making the water flow inside their hull. So, Averin immediately stops him and closes it. Later, the Russian president already reveals the crew's situation inside the Kursk. Upon announcing, he says to the families that the submarine is in a difficult position and almost in zero visibility. So, Tanya begins ranting, saying that the Russian navy is lying to them. Suddenly, it follows by the other wives who finally lose their control to be silent. Then Grudzinki, on the other hand, makes his call to take up Commander David's offer of assistance since the president refuses to accept it. Luckily, Commander David shows no hesitation to lend his offer and immediately pulls his divers from one of the Norwegian rigs of the Asgard oil field so that they can prepare and rescue the crew members. Going back to the compartment, Averin composes a goodbye to his family, hoping that his young son, Misha, might have some memories with him. He then goes to do the direction of Oleg to talk with him about his family. Luckily, Oleg offers him comfort by assuring his family will remember him. Later at night, the Russian submersible attempts to rescue again, but then they suddenly hear no taps from the men anymore, so they believe them to be near death already. Afterward, Oleg suddenly wakes up the crew and organizes a breakfast buffet, despite having little food available to raise morale. Oleg then asks Leo for help while calling the attention of everyone. However, Leo accidentally drops the oxygen cartridge into the water while they are celebrating. Because of that, it suddenly starts a flash fire that consumes the remaining oxygen. As all of them try to breathe, they, however, have left no choice but to accept their death as there are only minutes left of oxygen. Afterward, Averin begins bidding goodbye as the rest of the crew sing their sea shanty, the sailor's band. The movie ends with Commander David's men finally managing to enter their boat after waiting for a long time for the signal of the president. Unfortunately, they arrive too late and find no survivors anymore. To his dismay, Commander David leaves the room after seeing the dead bodies of the crew members on the screen. At the funeral, Misha suddenly refuses to shake hands with Admiral Petrenko because of his anger for not rescuing his father immediately. Unfortunately, the other kids show antagonism as well after knowing what has the president did at the stone walling and refusal to accept aid by the fleet. In honor of his father, Averin's fellow sailors suddenly give Misha his father's watch after seeing his courageous stand against the intimidating Admiral Petrenko. Feeling honored, Misha then shows relief after receiving his father's wristwatch, which gives him the luck to remember the memories of his father. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video please hit the like button and also subscribe my channel for more videos like this. See you in the next video.